Hi there. In today's lesson, I want to talk to you about coal and coal analysis. It is an organic-based fuel that is frequently used in combustion reactions to generate heat and energy. Coal is a black or brownish-black substrate. It comes from trees. So as the tree dies, the organic matter in the tree is compacted and converted into coal. Seeing that coal comes from trees and trees are made out of carbon, the main component of coal is carbon, and specifically fixed carbon. During the process in which the carbon is compacted after the tree starts rotting, the coal is converted into graphite-like substrates, which are carbon rings linked to each other quite tightly. But obviously there will also be other types of carbon in these coal. And these are typically referred to as volatile carbons. These are small hydrocarbons, straight chain, even aromatics, and oxygen compa containing components which have a lower molecular mass and that is not fixed. Hence, they would actually be lost once the coal will be started to be heated. Seeing that the coal will be dug out of the ground, we can expect that the coal be wet. We get two types of water that is described as free water in the coal. There can be surface water from rivers or rain, and then there could be hydroscopic water, water that's absorbed into the pores of the coal and slightly more bonded than the surface water which sits loosely on the outside. Speaking of water, there's also other type of water that we refer to in coal, and this is called bound water. Now this is a little bit of a difficult one to understand, but see the bound water as the available water that comes off once all the oxygen in the coal reacts with the hydrogen close to it. So for instance, the OHs and the O double bonds and things like that in the coal will react with the nearest hydrogen to form water. So this water is already intrinsically in the coal, but bound to the structure of the coal, and hence we refer to it as bound water. Remember, this is not truly water. It's just water that's going to come off from the oxygen in the coal when we start combusting the coal and we refer to this as bound water. Now looking at this bound water, we see that we have O's, for instance, linked to the outer rings of these graphite-like carbon structures. And in the same way, we can have other contaminants like nitrogen and sulfur linked to the coal. And once combusted, these will, combusted, these will go to NOxs and SOxs. We refer to them as SOx and NOx. So this means that the sulfur and the nitrogen in the coal will, once being combusted, actually come off and in the form of some sort of oxide. Now typically, if the sulfur and the nitrogen in the coal is less than 1%, they are ignored. Also, sometimes the N is just ignored completely and C as N2 going out. However, this is not true. And I like to focus on the N NOxs and the SOxs, the SOxs and the NOxs, because they are environmental pollutants. And if you burn coal, you must always be aware of them and make sure that you can remove them to keep the environment safe. Lastly, there can also be other contaminants in the coal. Now, these are typical, typically metal complexes or metal components. Think for yourselves. We know that plants and other you and other orga organisms need sodium, potassium, iron, calcium, aluminium to survive. Trace metals. And the same way the plant will actually absorb these through the water it takes through its roots into its structure. Now once that tree falls over and dies, where does these metals go? They tend to stay there. And on combustion, they get converted to ash. So we refer to the metal oxides or the metals in the system that's left after combustion as ash. For interest sake, potash is sodium oxide, and soda ash is sodium oxide, and potash is potassium oxide, typically used um, for making soaps that we got from fires. We can now group this free water, bonded water, volatile carbon, nitrogen, and sulfur all together as volatile matter. And this is the matter that we get coming off the coal once we expose the coal to a temperature of 1,200 Kelvin. 
we also have the water or the free water and we describe the free water as the water that comes off the coal at around about 100 degrees celsius now that's obvious the bound water is part of a chemical reaction but the free water is just water and if you heat it up to the boiling point of water it should evaporate next i want to start talking to you about the analysis of coal now you can think for yourself once we dug the coal out of the ground we dump it into big heaps and from there it will be taken to our plant so we can get the coal in four different ways we can have it as received coal and that's the coal wet rained upon coming to the plant. We could also have air dried coal, so that same wet coal gets received, put under some black, um, some tarpaulins and actually air dried. So we will lose some of the surface and hydroscopic water. Next we can have dried coal, where we typically now go and take this coal, dry it to roughly 100 degrees Celsius, the boiling point of water, to remove all the free water. Lastly, we can have moisture free coal. This is coal where all the water, including the bound water and free water, has been removed from the coal. We can now do our analysis, the following analysis, on any one of these four types of coal. This will typically be specified to you. Typically, two types of analysis are done on coal. The first being the ultimate analysis, which is typically an elemental analysis, and the second being approximate analysis, which is an approximate analysis of the coal. Now these two analyses are not the same. They're related to each other, and I'll show you calculations how we can use the one and the other to calculate the total analysis of the coal, but they are not the same. They tend to give similar stuff, but they're not the same. Let's look at the ultimate analysis, and I'm going to use values as an example to show you how do we use the ultimate and the proximity analysis to get a complete coal analysis? So let's say we have an ultimate coal analysis giving us the carbon, hydrogen, sulfur, nitrogen and ash in the coal. When we add all these up, we see that we get to 93.24%. And clearly this is not 100. So how do we get it to 100? We know that the coal must contain oxygen because there's water, for instance, in the coal as well. And this is the thing about the ultimate analysis. It is implied that by difference, the oxygen content is such that the sum must add up to 100. So if we take the 93.24, we subtract it from 100, we realize that it is 6.76% oxygen in the system. Now for this coal of ours, we get the proximate analysis to give us 3.2% free moisture 69.3% fixed carbon, volatiles of 21.0%, and ash of 6.5%. And we can see it's the same sample because the ash is the same for both these analyses. Let's now calculate the complete coal analysis. And we start by choosing a basis of 100 kilogram coal so that we can do our calculations easily. Let's start by saying that there's 79.90 kilogram total carbon and 69.3 kilograms of fixed carbon, which means that we'll have 10.6 kilogram of volatile carbon. Next, the 6.76 kilogram of O in the coal is equal to 4.225 kilomoles of O, and this will be bonded to 2 moles of hydrogen per mole of O, which means that we have 0 0.85 kilomole or 0 0.85 kilograms of H bonded, which is equal to 0 0.4225 kilograms of H2. By now subtracting the 0 0.85 from the total hydrogen in, which is 4.85, we find that we have 4.00 kilograms of hydrogen available for combustion. Now think back to our structure. That means on the outside of that fixed carbon, where we have the aromatic rings, there's still hydrogens left. And this adds up to be, in this case, 4 kilograms. Now we can calculate all the water in the system, which is 0 0.4225 multiplied by 18, the molar mass of the water, the moles of the water, 7.61 kilograms. We could also have gotten this by taking the mass of the oxygen and the mass of the hydrogen, adding them together and calculating the total kilograms of water. Now we know that this is all the water because we've taken all the oxygen, which would have been free water, surface water, 
hydroscopic water and bound water to calculate the amount of water. If we now subtract the free water, the 3.20 kilogram from the 7.61, we get the amount of bound water as 4.41 kilograms. And there we have our cold analysis action. We can now go and say that we know the amount of free water, 3.20 kilogram, the amount of bound water, 4.41 kilogram, the volatile carbon, which is 10.6 kilogram, the available hydrogen, the sulfur, and the nitrogen. And like we said before, those are all volatiles. So we have 21 kilograms or equal to 21% of volatiles, which we had in our proximity analysis. And we can now calculate the coal analysis or the total coal analysis, where we have all the carbon as 79.9%, the available hydrogen as 4.0%, the free water 3.2 and bound water at 4.41, the sulfur at 0.69, the nitrogen at 1.30, and the ash at 6.5 kilograms. If we add this all up, it gets it adds up to 100, which means we've not made a mistake. Now this analysis is in the end the analysis we're going to use to calculate what happens when we combust the coal to get energy. And that will be the next lecture. I hope that this discussion, explanation of coal analysis helps you a bit and that you can now do combustion problems quite easily when you get to the combustion problems. See you again soon.